Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you all this morning. Um, in early December, ahead of the Winter Olympics, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution entitled Building a Peaceful and Better World Through Sport and the Olympic Ideal. The resolution calls for the expectation that the Olympic Winter Games in Beijing will be a meaningful opportunity to harness the power of sport to advance the world by fostering an atmosphere of peace, development, resilience, tolerance and understanding. Yet amid the fanfare of Friday night's opening ceremony, Beijing 2022 kicked off under the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic and without official delegations from Australia, the US and eight democratic nations due to concerns over China's human rights record and broader geopolitical tensions looming large over the West's relationship with China. Despite this, the Olympics has been attended by 32 heads of government, including Russia, that announced a no limits pact with China at the day of the opening ceremony. So amid all this tension between sport and politics, we're going to post a quick little audience poll to get your thoughts on, on what you think about the relationship between sport and politics. Well, quite interesting. So um, 64% of respondents saying that we should not um, expect sport to be separated from politics and, and that there's an assumption that there's an interconnection um, between uh, sport and politics, particularly at major events. So um, thank you very much for um, giving your thoughts. Um, we'll now go to our expert speakers. Um, and Ray and Dom, thank you both for joining us today. Um, Ray, we might start with you. You've written quite widely on the matter of the interrelationship between sport and politics. Um, what are your thoughts about expectations on separating the two um, at events such as the Beijing, Beijing Winter Olympic Games? Well, first of all, congratulations on Australia on your gold medal. Um, very nice. Thanks a lot for inviting me to speak to this event. So the Beijing Olympics has started. Um, people are rightfully, you know, making comparisons. What's changed between 2008 and 2022 besides the fact that the stadium is pretty much empty during the open ceremony. So in looking at China between 2008 and 2022, you know, it has a lot of more money to throw around um, due to the economic growth. Uh, in, in the time that's passed, you also have Xi Jinping in charge of China instead of Hu Jintao, and he has a much stronger ideological pol and political grip on uh, Chinese society and also sort of demands to, to maintain that grip in a number of civic spaces. Prior to the um, start of the Olympics, we saw, you know, civil society crackdowns. We saw some rights lawyers uh, arrested um, and, and you had sort of the Olympic Committee of China saying these are the rules that you need to follow while you're in attendance at the games. So the sort of who makes sports political is is an interesting question. And because Olympic athletes, you know, are not exactly the same as, you know, NBA teams or, you know, professional soccer teams, they don't necessarily have the same income sources. Um, how they are competing is a very political process. It's much harder for athletes to sort of boycott uh, Olympic participation due to, you know, visibility for sponsors and the Olympics as a sort of sporting merit. Um, and also, you know, the host country can make things very political. And um, in recent events, I would also say that the IOC, the arbiter of the Olympics, has also sort of had its hand in politics. It's hosted numerous uh, conferences uh, in regards to Peng Shui, the, you know, tennis Grand Slam champion that posted a message on um, allegations of a former Chinese vice premier. So a very high level ranking official. Then her post got taken down and um, tennis stars and tennis associations abroad were very worried about, you know, her well-being. The IOC has consistently sort of, you know, had its president and um, issued statements. So it's been pretty actively political on behalf of uh, Chinese governments 
uh, position in all of this. So as you know, we're, we're going into, you know, many more events in the uh, next coming weeks, uh, including, you know, figure skating. I'm very excited to see American Nathan Chen take the ice. Um, but, you know, at the same time, because of how money and power operates in the background of these Olympics, it's very difficult to really cleanly separate out the sport. Um, Don, what about you? What uh, For the Australian context, um, Prime Minister Scott Morrison made a statement in December that he wouldn't se- that that he does separate the issues of sport and political issues, while at the same time announcing Australia's diplomatic boycott due to human rights abuses um, in China and Australia's own uh, diplomatic deadlock with Beijing. Um, what's your take on the on the separation between sport and politics? Yeah, I think Morrison's statement announcement was really interesting um, because he sort of mentioned human rights almost as an afterthought. Um, he sort of much more emphasised the sort of deteriorating relationship between Australia and China um, due to a number of factors, including, you know, the AUKUS um, agreement regarding nuclear um, powered submarines and the sort of the, this discussions between or lack of discussions between Australia and China on a number of other issues that plague the relationship. And he seemed to really tie Australia's decision to not participate to this um really fraud relationship where, you know, basically the the two sides in Australia and China aren't even talking to each other except at very, very junior levels. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Ray raised a really interesting question on who makes sport political. Um, My background is very much in the sort of constructivist, feminist viewpoint of international relations. And um, I believe that, you know, everything is political. From feminism, we know that even the personal is political. And in Australia, we know that whether a young woman smiles at the prime minister or not is also considered as political. So I think, you know, there's, and when it comes to a sports political, there's so many different viewpoints um, where sports and politics interact. So on the one hand, we have the host China, who says that, you know, we are not making sport political, um, but everyone that's boycotting is making a political spectacle out of it. But of course, we know that China isn't just hosting the games um, because they like sport, um, just like Russia hasn't been engaged in doping just because they really like um, good athletes. Um, China's really using the games to portray, on the one hand, to the world that, you know, China has arrived. China is... A, if not the global player, get used to it. And it's also using them to signal to its domestic audience um, or trying to sort of continue to sell the Chinese dream in a way. Then we have the IOC, which tries to separate, you know, it says it's separating sports and politics, which of course ignores that silence on political issues that come up during the games. It's just as political as speaking out. Um, Then you have boycotting countries that are saying, um, you know, we're not politicising it, but we are trying to, um, you know, raise a number of issues that concern us, and we get into that a bit more um, towards the end. Then, of course, we have countries that aren't boycotting but are saying that, you know, they're not going to China for COVID reasons, which is, of course, a bit of a cover, so they don't have to actually speak out um, against what's going on in China. And then we have a whole bunch of countries that have gone and have made very clear political statements, um, mainly, of course, the Russia China statement recently. Um, and then, you know, everything, it, you know, whether spectators watch or don't watch the games is or can also be construed as political. So there's so many different viewpoints here that I think we can unpack and I'm looking forward to doing that. Hmm. Great. Thanks, Dom. Um, Ray, to help us understand the, gr- the greater context around some of these diplomatic boycotts, um, which countries exactly are boycotting um, the Winter Olympics and, and what particular reasons have they given for doing so? Well, I mean, of course, I can't really omit the United States, which announced the boycott in December. Um, I believe other countries boycotting diplomatically include Australia, the UK, Canada, um, and recently India due to the decision by the Chinese Olympic Committee to send a torchbearer who had was a veteran of China's border clashes with India, which really set off the Modi 
government. So, you know, some some uh, countries were diplomatically boycotting to um, call greater attention to uh, China's policing actions in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, along with um, how it surveils and treats other ethnic minorities like Tibetans. Um, I haven't followed as closely uh, other countries other than America's rationale for boycotting, but they're fairly similar, I would say. Um, having said that, I've also uh, in the run up to, you know, a recent article that I was working on, on how the United States has specifically um handled Olympic sponsors in the IOC, uh, I've been looking at State Department statements after their, you know, boycott decision. And other than the boycott itself, uh, there's been not that many sort of official positions taken. They've taken a step back um, and they're uh, it, it's it, it's been a bit hands off when concerning the IOC, which, again, has been very active in um, pushing a specific political perspective and also, you know, American sponsors. Um, the response that state's spokesperson Ned Price um had was essentially like, we don't really tell our corporations what to do. We give them information on uh, Xinjiang and have them, you know, try to use, use their best judgment. So uh, it's interesting, the disparity between the language on the diplomatic boycott and then, you know, some of the con quite concrete stakes that, you know, American firms might have in the uh, Beijing Olympic Games, um, NBC, the main broadcaster uh, for, for the games has been, you know, quite active on social media, at least in, in like my Twitter feed um, and, you know, in TV commercials about how, you know, using putting the athletes first and foremost. But, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's still a very sort of political phenomenon that's that's going on. Athletes or no athletes. Um, Ray, can I just ask a follow up to that? Was was there was a full boycott ever under consideration? Um, like we have had full um, Olympic boycotts in the past. Was that was that ever considered for for this Olympics by 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 the nation that did uh, commit uh, that that did commit to the diplomatic boycott? Uh, from what I have seen in terms of statements by. Um, some legislators in America, including ones that are pretty hawkish on China, uh, they essentially said that a full boycott was disciplining athletes uh, to the extent that, you know, it wasn't something that um, they were pursuing. And I think mm -hmm. given the sort of political appetite for full boycotts or maybe lack thereof in America, that was not something that uh, gained a lot of traction. And it wasn't something that a lot of people were requesting of Biden. However, um, Hong Kong and Uyghur uh, activists after you know the diplomatic boycott, they moved on to essentially two requests. One was pressure on sponsors, including you know NBC, Coca Cola, Procter and Gamble, you know all major financial backers of the games. They also you know started to try to trend um, you know a hashtag on not watching uh, the games broadcast to try to dampen the numbers. Hmm. All right. Well, I, I think that moves into our next question um, quite well. Um, Dom, thinking about those human rights issues surrounding the games, um, would you say that concerns around Xinjiang are the main reason behind the, the diplomatic boycott or are there other factors at play? Um, Ray previously mentioned the issues surrounding tennis player Peng Shui and her disappearance and reappearance. Um, after her claims of sexual abuse at the hands of a party official. Um, are, are there particular uh, human rights issues that we're able to pinpoint as behind this diplomatic boycott? Um, yeah, there are, and I'll get into them in a second. I did just want to add to the previous question around, you know, why countries have decided to boycott um, and sort of, you know, as a way of illustrating that, yes, I do think human rights matter um, in these countries' decisions, but they're not the only or the, you know, the most 
present um, considerations. So the first country that actually announced a diplomatic boycott was Lithuania, which, of course, if you don't follow Lithuanian-Chinese relationships, um, you might still have heard about this. Um, that Lithuania and China are sort of engaged in a real um, diplomatic and economic standoff at the moment, which, you know, may be a bit too long to get into now, but if you want to ask questions about that, um, you know, feel free to do so in the Q&A function, just working the Q&A function here. Um, in terms of the human rights issues, um, yes, I do think that Xinjiang, um, Hong Kong, Tibet, and Taiwan are sort of the major issues. As far as I've seen, um, Peng Shui hasn't been raised when countries made um, the announcements of boycotts. Um, and I think that's partly because, you know, states deal with state matters and not necessarily with individuals. I do think that Peng Shui has had a big impact on um, populations and on the feminist movement in China. And I look forward to hearing a bit more about this maybe later on. Um, yeah, so... The human rights issues in China. I mean, I think the main one is Xinjiang. Um, and, you know, I, I come from this space and I like to call a spade a spade. So let's talk about the genocide that's happening in Xinjiang. Um, it's not just, you know, sort of Western governments that have um, pronounced this a genocide or bleeding heart human rights activists like myself. But in December um, last year, there was a People's Tribunal that concluded in the UK, which was headed by um, Jeffrey Nice QC, who was the lead prosecutor um, of the Slobodan Milosevic trial at the ICTY. And they found that while um, in Xinjiang, there haven't been any mass killings, which is, of course, the way we usually sort of tend to see um, genocide. It can be class classified as a genocide because China has shown um, its intent to destroy a significant um, part of the Uyghur population through forced sterilization and abortion. And I would say that is the main issue. Other issues, are, of course, are Hong Kong, where the introduction of the national security law in July 2020 has really put an end to the sort of vibrant civil society, free media um, space that has, you know, um, has sort of been a defining feature of Hong Kong for, for many years. Um, let's not forget about Tibet. Tibet was a big issue in 2008 um, and, you know, was sort of the darling of the human rights community. We hear much less about it these days, partly, oh, hello, Kat, <laughs> um, partly because um, I read that there's currently more foreign journalists in North Korea even than there are in Tibet. But, you know, the Tibetan population faces um, forced, um, sorry, um, arbitrary arrests and torture and, um, you know, sort of restrictions to freedom of their expression and thought and association. And there's also an issue around um, settlements going on there. And finally, I'd say that Taiwan is usually talked about in these geostrategic and economic terms, but, you know, were China to invade um, Taiwan, and I'm not saying that's going to happen in the next few years, but were they to do it, let's not forget that that would have a huge human cost as well. Mm. Um, Dom, if we can just stick with you, um, I'm, I'm curious to understand the, the calculations that a government makes to decide on um, following through with a diplomatic boycott um, at a major sporting event such as this. Um, is, is, is there a way to measure the intended impact of a boycott um, when, when, when a country makes that decision? Um, and can a boycott a, a, evoke any particular action on that host nation or, or, is, or is the objective more to, to send a message? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think the question of whether boycotts work really has to first examine what the boycotts try to achieve. And I think sometimes, you know, people say, oh, the boycotts don't work because China won't change its policies um, against these issues that I've just talked about. And of course it's not. Um, I think that's a, a false expectation. Um, I think that the main reason the countries, um, you know, did decide on, the dip on a diplomatic boycott was to sort of um, deny China the chance to, to shine in a way and to sort of portray itself as this, you know, benign superpower um, and good neighbour, which, um, as I said at the start, is very important to China. So if that was the objective, then I think it has worked. Um, of course, much more to our audience than the domestic audience, because any mention of these boycotts has been, has been censored. Um, then I think there's another reason as to why countries might boycott. Um, and that's, you know, China isn't the only um, country that has um, quite severe um, human rights issues at home. 
as we know, and it's really also a signal to the rest of the world to show, hey, you know, these norms that we constantly talk about, um, we still care about them and we'll continue to raise them, um, even or maybe especially as, you know, China and Russia are sort of portraying this unified front of a new global order. Mm. And then just on a sort of personal um from a personal perspective, um, you know, I, I, I wrote it down somewhere because I really wanted to get this out, even if, if it's going to make me sound like, again, the bleeding heart human rights person that I am. But, um, you know, the late Tasman Tutu said, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Um, and I think that's a really important point to make as well. It's not always about concrete, you know, mm. action and reaction, but the wider norms system. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, yeah, thanks for that, Dom. Um, just a reminder to anyone on the session today, um, please drop your questions into the Q&A box um, and we'll be getting to those um, in about 20 minutes. Um, so in Australia, we're quite familiar um, with the case of Peng Shui. Um, we've just completed the Australian Open um, where there was the incident of uh, Tennis Australia initially banning protesters who were wearing um, T-shirts adorned with where is Peng Shui. Um, Tennis Australia deemed that those t-shirts were originally too political um, before having a change of heart once the story went viral um, and the t-shirts were then allowed throughout the rest of the tournament. Um, Ray, in, in light of major international events seeking overseas investment and sponsorship um, and thereby potentially being at risk of becoming entangled um, with geopolitical events, to what degree should we expect these sporting bodies and institutions to factor in uh, human rights in their decision making? Well, I think the question of sports and human rights came up in in the United States um, prior to the question of, you know, international human rights um, here in the United States. One of our major sports governing bodies, the NFL, effectively blacklisted Colin Kaepernick, a former you know quarterback for protesting police brutality against black Americans. And this was something that was effectively um, um, sort of informally decided, you know, maybe not by just coaches and players who all thought pretty highly of this person's athletic ability, but due to owner interests at, at the time. Um, so now we have, you know, Black Lives Matter and racism plastered on um, helmets, but we have news coming out like a black coach being effectively not considered for a job, um, it, 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 which has been the sort of big domestic sports scandal in, in the United States. So all of these sort of, you know, maybe smaller instances like coaching inequality, uh, you know, labor issues in American sports, those have all been kind of simmering in, in the background. And, you know, given the heavy sort of investments that, you know, interconnected corporate interests have played in sports, both domestic and international. I'd say that this is going to be a question here here to stay um, because the questions of, you know, labor, the questions of race and sports, um, the question of certainly gender in sports, given that even, you know, China's uh, women's national team just scored, you know, a victory when the men did not, leading some people on Weibo to go, why are our women's soccer players paid so much less when our men's soccer team is embarrassing? This is actually not controversial. Domestically, a lot of Chinese people think that the men's national team is embarrassing. Um, mm. Having said that, uh, I, I would say that um, the, the, the uh, Dom's earlier sort of remark about, you know, sort of staying neutral in the face of injustice really brings to mind the question of, you know, the, one of my questions that I've been really f facing in, in terms of, you know, American government conduct and interest, which is, can you more or less, you know, pursue or allow your your corporations to, to pursue everything that they want while continuing to try to stand for uh, human rights? Because the amount of investment, talent, cultivation 
and development of surveillance technology by American corporations has been immense. It's been multinational. Um, it's been part of the sub you can't have a, a surveillance supply chain with China alone. And so in sort of looking at the questions of, you know, Xinjiang, um, we've seen American uh, corporations like Qualcomm tr use a Caribbean tax havens to funnel money to uh, invest in surveillance. And these sort of capital flows have still been something that haven't been decoupled, even though diplomatic relations between China and the United States have soured. And so uh, in sort of following the money, um, I think that's one sort of really interesting way of looking at how corporations can take sides without sort of, you know, verbalizing taking sides. Mm. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Ray. Um, Dom, we have the um, Qatar 2022 Football World Cup um, later this year um, that's been embroiled in its own series of uh, controversies. How would you say other sporting global bodies such as FIFA um, balance uh, sport events and, and human rights issues? Ah, FIFA, my favourite organisation. I should say that I am from Switzerland, so I've got this special um, interest in FIFA. I don't know, I don't know about <laughs> FIFA, but I don't know, whenever I see them say anything, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think sport, global sporting um, organisations have always, um, or at least for a very long time, had this sort of, I'm going to call it pretense, that they want to keep sport and politics separate. Um, I say pretense because they, of course, use politics when it suits them and their agenda. I mean, you know, they, they often make pretty grand statements around how sport can contribute to, you know, global peace and development and harmony and whatever um, whatever else. Um, and talking about FIFA, the FIFA boss, FIFA boss Infantino recently made the claim that if only the um, Soccer World Cup could happen every two years, there'd be fewer Mediterranean, um, so sort of deaths in the Mediterranean Sea because you know, there wouldn't be any push factors from Africa to Europe. Um, so, you know, I think they, they, they keep it separate when it suits them and then they use, um, you know, sort of the language around those ideals when they want to. Um, really interesting, of course, recently has been the different difference in how the IOC and the Women's Tennis Association have dealt with um, the issue of Peng Shui in terms of, you know, the IOC um, has really remained neutral. And some people have accused it of having become a sort of a mouthpiece for um, the CCP, whereas the Women's Tennis Association has really taken a very strong stance and said, you know, we don't believe she's safe and withdrawn basically all tournaments from China, which is which is a big gesture and very financially, um, you know, problematic for, for the Women's Tennis Association as well. There's a lot of money in sport. I'm always amazed when I see the numbers, a lot of money in sport and in China, of course. Um, yeah. And I think that really brings up some of the issues that Ray has been talking about as well in terms of um, the corporate and financial side to all of these, these issues, which I think governments have tried to sort of stay out of as Ray has just outlined. Mm. Um, Ray, I'd, I'd like to get a read on, on the response to the diplomatic boycott um, on the ground in China. Um, how has it been received? Um, and was it considered a surprise that predominantly Western nations um, were behind diplomatic boycotts? I don't think this is something that was completely out of left field pun not intended for um, the Chinese state. This has been, you know, th th this has been something that China's foreign ministry has pushed back on consistently. They see matters of Xinjiang and Hong Kong as uh, issues of sovereignty that um, they sort of, you know, have not really been flexible on. I don't anticipate them being very flexible on. Um, and just to add on Peng Shui, uh, I really want to comment on the nature of sort of celebrity and sport within China's current environment. Over the past year, uh, China has sort of shifted some of the, the Chinese state has kind of shifted its uh, expectations of celebrities, of public figures. Um, you know, it's been a decades long endeavor to have a better sort of way of managing public opinion within China. But um, the sort of 
hold over key opinion leaders has, has only sort of uh, become more restrictive over time. So at the domestic level, there's more patriotism that's kind of expected out of, you know, key opinion leaders, uh, less scandal um, and the, the sort of discourses around those scandals is also something that the uh, state is interested in keeping quiet. So, um, and it, abroad, I would say the goals is sort of non-critical content uh, and enforcing a sort of uh, an area of conduct that has uh, that has athletes, sporting institutions, and um, you know, various Olympic committees more or less staying uh, neutral. And neutral on, you know, Chinese state terms means neutral on the ideological terms. Um, Ray, can I, can I just follow up with the, the, the mentioning about Peng Shui? Is there, um, is there any indication that, that the case of Peng Shui has uh, simulated um, a, a sort of Me Too movement response in China? I'm glad you asked because I actually wrote about this uh, in Wired magazine this past winter. Um, Peng Shui's post stayed up about, I'd say like 20, 30 minutes before it was taken down. However, it did sort of spark some discussions about, you know, not necessarily challenging the political status quo so much as, you know, can powerful people be held accountable? Peng Shui is not the first, um, even in recent memory, um, woman to come forth with allegations. There was a woman named Xianzi who uh, accused a major television anchor of groping her. Um, and she, it was taken to court. She did unfortunately lose um, due to the judge not admitting evidence that she had presented. And so the question of, you know, how can, uh, you know, people talk about issues of sexual assault, of, you know, being taken advantage of, and and the, the it really does sort of factor into which of their stories become politically sensitive because of the nature of who Pong accused, it immediately got flagged and her, her post was very sort of just like, like, I don't care if I get burned by this, this is what I'm posting. And in the aftermath, the attention that it drew on her, um, led her to recant, which, by the way, recanting is something that, you know, people who have experienced sexual assault, harassment, rape, um, that this is this is not completely unheard of. Um, I don't know what her specific situation is, but as of right now, um, she has not given a uh, interview without, I think, Olympic um Olympic Committee staff members present. And I think the French magazine that had access to her um, sort of, you know, had to go through a uh, go between and also interview her in, in Chinese, despite her knowing English. So. Mm. Um, and, and Ray, just um, sticking with you for a second, um, we, like we mentioned earlier, um, obviously Beijing held the 2008 Winter Games, now hosting this year's 2022 Winter Olympic Games. China's the first country to, to host um, both uh, global events. Um, and if we think about the 2008 Games, as you mentioned earlier, um, it, it certainly marked the arrival of the People's Republic of China on the world stage um, and was described by some as China's coming out party. Um, in, in what ways can we use the Games as a benchmark for how China, um, and in particular its relationship with the, re with the West, um, has changed um, since 2008? Well, in 2008, um, I believe not as many social media sites were banned in China as they are now, um, in addition to new news organizations and websites, um, although we were starting to see interest in, you know, the construction and growth of the Great Firewall. But um, it, essentially, 2008 China, I think, was the, the economic goals at the time were that China was open for business. Uh, diplomatically, there was um, uh, 
building blocks of additional student exchanges going from China to the U.S. Um, and uh, to some extent, not the same scale, but vice versa. And so, you know, this people to people connection was, you know, stronger. But at the same time, in 2008, I would say that um, the sort of overall like overt grip of law enforcement was not as widespread as they are in 2022. The There were protests along the torch uh, relay by uh, Tibetan advocates, but at the time um, I think that we hadn't had the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. Um, it wasn't until 2009 that um, China started really focusing on Xinjiang after um, unrest in the region sort of broke out. And, you know, after Uyghurs had, you know, still, they, they, they were certainly facing discrimination within 2008, but not uh, surveilled to the same extent that they are right now. So uh, law enforcement and I would say the economic interests and economic status of China would probably be the key differences between 2008 summer and 2022 winter. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned social media. I, I, I read last night that the um, Olympic Village um, does not experience the same hurdles um, of China's Great Firewall that, that the Chinese um, population experience, um, which is interesting. And I believe that was the same for 2008 as well. Um, Dom, a final question for you before we go um, to some really great questions from the audience. Um, given the fact that major sporting events can provide legitimacy um, to countries with questionable human rights records, as you yourself mentioned earlier. Um, can we expect any changes um, from this pressure um, to the selection and awarding of, of major sporting events? Um, that's a tough one. Um, I don't think so. And I think it's partly because, um, you know, we've seen for a few decades now that hosting major sporting events like the Olympics um, isn't really worth it for countries. And of course, democratic countries are, um, you know, beholden to their constituents and their, the voters. And when the IOC awarded the Olympics to China, there was only really one other candidate left, um, I believe it was Kazakhstan. Mm. So, you know, I think that really, it has really narrowed who puts their hand up to host Olympics. Um, and, you know, I mean, the IOC is very strong and repeatedly has been very strong on wanting to separate sports and politics. So I, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, um, let's now come to some um, questions we have um, from the audience and please keep those questions coming through in the Q&A box. Um, the first question we have is from Christian Wells. Um, Christian asks, what does the panel make of China and Russia declaring a no limits partnership, uh, backing each other over standoffs on Ukraine and Taiwan and promising to collaborate more against the West before the opening ceremony? After China supporting this notion of not politicizing sport, this move seemed rather counterintuitive. Um, Dom, I think I might get you to handle that one first. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, good point, Christian. Um, it does seem counterintuitive. <laughs> um, and I think it goes to show what we've been saying this whole time and what something like 64% of um, you guys have said as well, that, you know, I don't think anyone is really keeping sport and politics separate, even if, you know, a lot of actors might want to. Um, yeah, that statement um, was very detailed, very long, something like 5,000 words. And as you say, it touched on a lot of topics. Um, what it, I think it really goes to show that the extent to which China and Russia um, see a common world view with regards to the global order, um, which very directly opposes the US. What the statement doesn't do is um, name Ukraine specifically. And I believe, um, based on commentary I've read by people who are much more aware of these issues than I am, um, that China wouldn't back Russia at any cost. So I think there are limits. I think Ukraine would be a limit. I don't think China wants to back um, a potential Russian invasion into Ukraine. 
Um, but they did support um, Russia's demand, you know, basically for NATO to stop um, adding new members, specifically Ukraine. They also specifically um, mentioned Taiwan and, and AUKUS as issues where they um, there is a lot of alignment. And also maybe relevant for this discussion, um, Russia has expressed um, its support for China to, you know, carry out anti-terrorism um, operations, which of course is code for genocide in Xinjiang. Mm. Um, Ray, any any comments from yourself for for that question? So I have no comments on Ukraine because that is not a region that I feel qualified to comment on. However, I will say that China. Uh, consider has traditionally considered its peripheral issues, uh, including, you know, Hong Kong, Taiwan, as issues that uh, it is legitimately able to sort of formulate policy for and that uh, the long held opinion by Beijing has been that the United States has been trying to contain China within the region. Mm. Okay, well, moving on to our second question um, from Ben Westcott. Um, Thanks, guys. These boycotts um, are some of the first since the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s. Does moving, does moving um, again towards boycotts, um, uh, so, um, and and moving again towards boycotts, um, do boycotts, are boycotts clearly split? Um, along political lines um, and risk uh, exacerbating global divides, um, pushing the world towards a second Cold War? Um, Are there other alternatives? Um, So maybe, Ray, I'll get you to take that one. Um, First of all, do you see boycotts as being divided along political lines? Well, the diplomatic boycotts, I think, have just been mostly reinforced what a lot of countries have already expressed to China. Um, Like, for instance, you didn't really see any countries that um, sort of newly emerged, aside from maybe Lithuania, which I think was in uh, locking horns with China diplomatically because of its uh, more high profile relationship with Taiwan. Um, But like China kind of knew which United States it was going to deal with in, you know, 2022, definitely knew, you know, which Australia was dealing with in, in 2022. So I would say that this is not a sort of significant, uh, huge shift. Um, as for the question of, you know, are we in a cold war? Are we heading towards a cold war? Uh, the econ- I would still say the economic connections between uh, China and the United States over, you know, productivity um, is, is still something that is really key to the political stability of both countries. Um, having said that, um, you know, even though they haven't decoupled cleanly, uh, I have not seen a lot of off ramps towards sort of cooler temperatures between uh, China and and the United States. The sort of interactions between State Department and the foreign ministry recently have uh, they haven't been really like made a lot of sort of movement along the sort of trade front along, you know, sort of diplomatic and people to people changes, the consulates that uh, the United States tit for tat closed in Houston and Chengdu, I think are still closed at the moment. And so uh, the, just it, I think it's in very much in kind of a stasis right now where neither side wants to be like the side that, you know, gives up something. Hmm. And, and Ray, just moving back to that idea around the, the impact on big business, um, I, do we see any any impact on on, on the bottom line of, of businesses that are embroiled in these controversies? And and you know, do we see increased uh, consumer boycotts of of, of companies that um, you receive reputational harm um, from from being implicated in, in geopolitical events? Well, public outcry is is something that happens when, you know, foreign companies in 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 China kind of step in something that they inadvertently did. So, for example, Intel. Uh Intel I think was complying with uh new laws about 
forced labor uh, products. It released a uh, sort of statement. The, the statement sort of went viral and eventually it had to release an apology that says, you know, this is not a sort of position that our corporation is taking. We are, you know, acting in, in compliance. And the word compliance is really something that like has gotten kind of stuck uh, for, for me because that is uh, typically what a company says uh, in response to, you know, having to censor something or uh, having to sort of configure uh, their product a certain way, like Airbnb in China um, had certain restrictions about lending to uh, minorities. And so like we are complying with the local law in order to operate has been kind of a standard line. And it's, you know, went from everywhere from Intel to uh, Airbnb, which is, I think, also sponsoring the games to, you know, Apple removing apps from its app store. So compliance has been kind of the go to sort of response Um, at the same time. um, I, I think this like the sort of economic participation of sponsors in the games, it's been something that the United States has generally kind of sort of, you know, it's kind of just let it exist and mostly stuck to sanctions on Chinese uh, national China, China based corporations. Mm, okay, great. Um, now coming to a sorry, question. Sorry, sorry, James, if I could just add something to Ben's question um, regarding, you know, they're not having been any major boycotts since the end of the cold war. That's, that's definitely true. Um, I do think that the story that we're telling now about the 2008 Beijing summer Olympics um it's a bit different to at least how I remember it and how things were written at the time. Um, before the game started, there was um, massive controversies around Tibet, around you know China's support for a genocidal regime in Sudan, around the Darfur genocide. Um, so much so that you know there were big um, demonstrations in Paris and in London. And I think the UK Prime Minister um, at the time was Gordon Brown, and his sort of attendance at the games, I think really illustrated how the games shifted China's image because he, um, along with Angela Merkel, um, didn't attend the opening ceremony, um, much like leaders didn't at this ceremony, but he did attend the closing ceremony because of the way the sort of conversations around China shifted. Um, And then, of course, you know, 2018, and I'll give sports that, there have been some nice moments as well. Um, 2018, when... You know, the North and South Korean um, athletes sort of marched together under the Korean unification flag was was quite a nice moment. And, you know, I think there are positive moments to look forward to as well. Mm. Okay, great. Um, A a question from um, a friend of mine and former colleague, Zach Eggleston. G'day, Zach. Um, In his opening uh, ceremony speech, IOC President Thomas Bach um, made some quite powerful statements on working towards world peace global cooperation and dialogue, um, even with bitter rivals. Do you think, um, and I'll get you to take this one, Don, um, this will be heard by any liberal democratic governments around the world, or does it play too much to the more autocratically minded? Um, Yeah, I think everyone sort of recognises these um, comments for what they are, um, which is, you know, the IOC really trying to um, deflect from the lot of controversies that have been surrounding these games. Um, and, you know, as I said, as I just said, actually, um, with the um, North South Korean um, moment in 2018, which, you know, was a big breakthrough. It was the first time that a North Korean um, sort of member of the regime and of the, the family went down south since the Korean, since the end of the Korean War and then led to, you know, like a summit. Of course, we know that hasn't led to much, but I do think there is um, scope for the games to have those positive connotations. Um, but then, you know, if we accept that, we might, must also accept that they can have the negative connotations that we've just been talking about for the last um, hour. And I think everyone recognises and accepts that, you know, the US, Australia, China. I think everyone sees that. <laughs> do, you, do you think this Olympic storm has, has caused significant reputational harm to, to the IOC itself? Um, I would say um, Peng Shui and the Olympics have caused 
harm. I've, I've said, but I'm not a big sports fan, um, unlike Ray, but I've never seen so much focus on the IOC itself, at least since I've been following the news. Mm. Ray, do you want to respond to that as well? Well, nobody is forcing the IOC to have these Peng Shui press conferences. Uh, this has been something that they've just sort of, you know, put forth um, either, you know, on their own or, you know, encouraged by Chinese Olympic Committee. I don't know what, what their process is. So um, in, in terms of sort of, I guess, athlete advocacy, uh, this is, it's been a troubling trend for the IOC even prior to the Olympics. Uh, this time, this time in Beijing, there has been, you know, clampdowns on what type of, you know, protest or political expression that athletes can have. And, um, I, in, uh, the 2021 games in Tokyo, I think shot put, medalist Raven Saunders was, you know, investigated uh, at for a sort of gesture um, at the at the medal podium. And the question of, you know, political expression by athletes, so, which, by the way, the IOC itself, I think, helps field an, a refugee Olympic team, which I don't know how you can divorce the politics of that. But if you can, you know more than me. Um, but basically, the the sort of you know, we need to sort of come together with like even the bitterest of rivals. It, it's it's kind of like kicking the can down the road so so that the IOC itself doesn't have to handle the ramifications. And of course, they're not a governing body, but uh, at the same time, when you have as much money and as much of a platform as they do, you can't really say that they have no power. Mm. Oh, and there, yeah, I think, Ray, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, at the very start of this discussion, um, James, you asked whether countries had considered a full boycott. And at the 1980 um, Olympics in Moscow, you know, the US had a sort of had a full boycott um, of including its athletes. But that's not actually up to lawmakers. It's actually up to national Olympic committees to decide whether they send their athletes or not, which I think... Yeah, it's really interesting and really illustrative of how much power they actually have. Mm. Okay, well, um, we do need to wrap up, but I just want to say we've got one final question that's a great one to end on. Um, so just a, a 30, rec 30 second response from both of you. Um, any learnings for Australia in the lead up to uh, Brisbane 2032? Dom, do you want to take this one first? <laughs> don't commit massive human rights abuses. Um, yeah, look, I think there's so much um, to what, so much still to happen um, in the years until, you know, Brisbane and um, I'm a Brisbane girl in a, in a way. So I'm, I'm kind of excited about that Olympics, but I think there's a lot of issues that are going to come up with um, the China Australia relationship in particular and, you know, we've just been talking so much about China's human rights record, but of course, Australia has to recognise that Australia, sorry, that China is the major power in our region and globally, and we have to um, we have to find a way to deal with that, which we currently which we're currently not doing. Mm. Um, and and Ray, final comment from you. Uh, so as somebody who is Chinese American right now and seeing people go get super weird about a Chinese American skier skiing for, for Team China, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, really value the Chinese Australians in your community. And um, if someone is, you know, does choose to, to like skate, like ski or, you know, play sports for, for a different country's team, uh, maybe direct some of that anger and energy towards their sponsors because that's where the money is. And that's kind of my sort of shtick. <laughs> mm, excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Ray and Dom, both of you, for, for, for being so frank and, um, you know, for, for really offering your expertise on what's been such a wonderful wide ranging discussion. Um, you know, not only have we talked about sport and politics, but just showing the uh, interconnectedness of sport with business, civil society, tech, feminism, um, was really great to kind of discuss and, and flesh out these issues with you today. Um, so I'd like to encourage um, our viewers to engage with the work 
of these younger foreign policy experts. Um, so both uh, Dom and Ray are on Twitter. So please make sure you um, give them a follow um, and make sure you read Ray's latest piece for Wired.com, um, arguing that the US is still powering the Olympics despite the diplomatic boycott. Um, that's just being dropped into the chat now. Um, and our, our Generation Asia work expands this year. So if you like this program, you'll enjoy more content being produced under this important pillar of our work at Asia Society um, and from young people in Australia and the region. Um, have a look at our website and get in touch with uh, our Gen A head, our, uh, our Gen A lead, Eloise Dolan, um, for more information. Um, and finally, um, for the China interested people um, among us on the call today, um, make sure you check out our newly launched China Executive briefing website that we run here at Asia Society. Um, it's a one-stop shop providing up-to-date, impartial and public, publicly accessible analysis of China's key economic policies um, and their implications for Australia. And we've got some really great programs um, as part of that series coming up in the next few weeks. Um, thanks again, um, Dom, Ray, um, and also Eloise and Fung Yuen for arranging today's session. Um, thanks for joining us, um, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.